everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. I felt a great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, I got a job for me. Meet me. Where's the green? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Welcome to the History Channel Radio Edition 2034 Year in Review. I'm Bradford Wells III, and this week we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the classic radio show Everything Old is New Again. In 2014, 20 years ago, talk radio was defined by sports talk, political talk, and financial talk. Lifelong radio fan Douglas Viviani and his co-host David Cohen burst onto the talk radio scene and did what many thought was impossible. It turned talk radio on its ear, providing a format that made radio fun again. This week on the History Channel Radio Edition 2034 Year in Review, we look into the birth of the current ratings king and talk radio phenomenon, which has since been imitated but never equaled. America's entertainment pop culture talk show sold itself to the networks, in the words of Douglas Viviani, as two guys sitting in a bar arguing over who is the best Disney princess. It was a bold format change at the time, a comparison of present pop culture to pop culture of the past. So let's turn back the clock to the early years of Everything Old is New Again with our on-the-spot reporter, Johnny Jones. Thank you, Bradford. It's uh, great to hear and be with you here at the uh, Radio Broadcast Hall of Fame in New York City. Let's take a look right away and go back to the original argument that you love to have uh, where the two boys had arguments about what is their favorite favorite Disney princess, starting with David Cohen. Right, and Tiana, I would say, would, would be, if we were having a, the fantasy draft pick of Disney princesses, uh, Tiana would be my number one. And why would you say that? Because she uh, basically is an entrepreneur. She's very self-assured. She chose to become a frog rather than, you know, she, just, to, just to have a good relationship, she chose to become a frog. Well, there you go. They had the uh, argument that uh, two gentlemen usually have at the, the local drinking establishment. No, Bradford? Or yeah, that was that was really uh, really fun at the time. Uh, <laughs> well, the, Douglas Viviani countered with that with his own argument. <laughs> All right, let's see if anyone knows who my favorite is. Let's see. Now, who's daddy's favorite? Rapunzel. There you go. So it's well known in my house that I'm the big Rapunzel fan. As far as I'm concerned, Rapunzel is someone that turns her life around. Effectively, she doesn't find a prince. She finds a guy that's basically a burglar, right? Right. And he turns his life around to a better person through her actions. She goes into this uh, nefarious uh, bar uh, where these these characters that you think would take advantage of her, and she turns them all around, talking about their dreams and how they can achieve their dreams. She's inspirational. She has the courage to say, no to her mom, uh, which tells her to stay in that that castle her whole life, that the world is terrible. She's like, no, I want to experience the, the world. She's smart. She figures out that she's the princess uh, based upon the evidence that presented. Right. So she's very logical in, in that way. And and sh- the ending, I think everyone has seen this movie, I hope. <laughs> seen, it, it, the ending is tremendous where uh, she makes a deal with her mom to go with her mom if her mom allows her to revive with her superpower uh, of her hairs, um, Flynn Rider. Um, I just think that the nobility there um, to sacrifice her life for another is, is tremendous. I mean, I mean, this argument goes on and on and on. These two sat at the proverbial bar every week, brought back uh, memories and arguments that uh, people just didn't have on the radio back in those no, days. No, and it's it's important, uh, Johnny, you're right, to, to put it in context. Back then, when you turned on the radio, you heard two guys arguing over the local sports teams, or Democrat versus Republican. So, you know, this, this concept of arguing over Disney princesses certainly was new. It was new, and of course it's it's caught fire, and it's all you hear on the radio now. I think now, in the year 2034, we're looking to go back to a little bit of sports, because everybody followed this format that Viviani and Cohen started back in 2014, and it's 
it's everywhere now. And so uh, I think that uh, that's the test of it's, it really shows the test of time that this show is uh, is a, a groundbreaker. And that's why we're celebrating it. Let's listen to the now famous Angelica Giuliana Viviani. We all know her for her. Uh, well, I'll, you know, so you know what? She's so famous. I don't even need to tell you why she's famous. But right now, this is when she was seven years old and she was putting in her two cents on the air as to who was her favorite. Princess. Let's see what the, our friend Angelica Giuliana Viviani has to say about her favorite. Angelica, which princess is your favorite? Cinderella. Tell me why. Because she never gives up and she's brave and kind and helps the animals do her toys. And because that the princess is really kind and her stepsisters are not, but then they figure out that they have to be good to be a good sister. And I like that. Yeah, they learn a, a wonderful lesson. See that? <laughs> How do you like that? Wow. I mean, she brought that, we all know, she brought that sense of adventure in life and learning a lesson, which she learned from her dad, Douglas Viviani. And she actually has, as we all know, solved that problem in the Middle East with that attitude, just from the Disney princesses. It's a pretty amazing thing to see her in her infancy right now. That is. It's great that we have that we have that on tape. Before she was knighted and so forth by the Queen of England for that whole fiasco back in 2022. We know about that. We'll talk about that another time, of course. But let's just hear from the, uh, uh, the, the we'll just say, the un, um, unappreciated Leo Viviani at four. He gave us the definitive note as to who wins this argument and who is the favorite princess of all time. Let's see what now my three-year-old, who's his favorite princess, is Leo. <laughs> Leo, tell us who's your favorite princess or prince. Um, the Hulk. Tell me why you like the Hulk so much. Because I want to grow up as him. Okay, and is he a prince or a princess? He's a he's a superhero. <laughs> he, you couldn't fool him. No. Prince or princess? He's a superhero. I mean, we've all learned uh, in time he's used his fame as being on this radio show for the last 20 years uh, to take it one step beyond. This kid, uh, uh, right, right back from the infancy of four years old, he cut through all the BS, right? I mean, he was right to it. Yeah, it's amazing how those two kids were spawned by someone like Douglas Viviani. The uh, the the, the g genetic code is just, it always will be a mystery. It shows you the importance of pop culture, that's for sure. Back here at uh, the Broadcast Hall of Fame in New York City, you look at the walls and, and you see the pictures of uh, uh, of the, the Cohen, the David Cohen and the Douglas Viviani uh, once over. You see that those pictures. You know that these two had the face for radio, for sure. But Douglas Viviani's children, uh, Angelica and Leo, they certainly have gone way well be above and beyond. They're on the front of the, the, the National Enquirer, which is the, the newspaper of record now, as we know. As replacing, unbelievable as that sounds, yes, that is <laughs> replacing true. Replacing the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. This is the, this is the magazine, that you, the newspaper that you go to all the time. It's the only one left, actually. Uh, everything else is online. So uh, what, what do you have to feel about this argument that they love to have on this, everything old is new again? Uh, that is something that was new at the time. Uh, people don't like to argue, but argument you love to have, what does that mean? That's their, that was their catchphrase in the beginning. Do you have, a, a, Bradford, some input on your research? as to what, uh, what that was all about. Well, you know, in talking with my father, who was a, a part of that show back then, uh, Bradford, my namesake, Bradford Wells, um, you know, I think he saw it as more of a, uh, in, instead of the, the intense political and, and, and even the sports themes, arguments got really heated on the radio. This was something that was more of a diversion and I think really tuned in uh, to what people wanted to hear and wanted to discuss, something that was just more lighthearted and, and fun to argue about. And again, something you, you can argue with over a beer if you're at the right bar, so to speak. Exactly. Uh, arguing the princesses. But they went through lots of other topics. We'll come back, and uh, Bradford, what do you have to say? We'll return and, uh, for the 2034 celebration of 20 years of Everything Old is New Again, right after these commercial prisons. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Okay, what, what is happening now, Jay? Well, we're going to return to Everything Old is New Again with uh, uh, Doug and Dave. Oh, okay. I got nothing else better to do. 
Welcome back to the History Channel Radio Edition 2034 Year in Review, where we continue our celebration of the 20th anniversary of Everything Old is New Again, the radio show that rocked the radio world. Let's take a look at the child's point of view of pop culture that was always considered a source of inspiration. Let's look back at Douglas Viviani's daughter, Angelica, and her take on the 2016 release of the live-action Jungle Book movie. What's up with uh, Jungle Book and the live-action? What about the new Jungle Book movie coming out? Are you looking forward to that? Absolutely. Like, I've seen, like, tons of commercials of it. It looks so good. Is it okay that it's not a cartoon? Yeah, it's okay. It, it, it's the same movie, so I don't mind. See that? There she goes. She doesn't mind. <laughs> she's a piece of work, that kid. Let I me gotta... tell you, she's very precocious. <laughs> So that was America's Sweetheart, as you may have, may have guessed, at the tender age of seven years old. Of course, Angelica later replaced David Cohen as the co-host of the program during a particularly difficult contract negotiation. Of course, now in 2034, we know Angelica as the world's most precocious magician. And let's look at a peek into the genesis of her interest in magic, which was caught on Everything Old is New Again and their microphone. Angelica, do you know who Harry Houdini is? Uh huh. I read um, some some things about him in my Magic Trios book, um, Hurry Up Houdini, where two kids meet Harry Houdini and they know some things about him. He was um, a famous magician, and th he did like so many cool tricks, like going in a box filled with water, like for, and then they closed the curtain and there was like four. Minutes and then all of a sudden, they are, they're like, "Where is this person?" And then they open up the curtain, and then he was gone. And then one person puts up their hat. It was just a lady girl, and on the other side, he took off his hat, and it was Harry Houdini. He was the famous Harry Houdini. Angelica's love of magic was ignited by the over-the-air radio trick Douglas performed on the radio show. Let's listen to that magic. Pick out a card, David. Okay. Michael, pick out a card. Got it. All right, look at it, memorize it. Now, on the piece of paper, write down double the value of that card. You're also, step two, you're going to add three to that number. Here's where the calculator comes in. Multiply times five. Young David Cohen, what is your number? 99. You have a number of 99. I cannot. That's not possible. You did the math wrong. Uh, Mike, what do you got for a number? I got 37. All right, 37. You have a th 37? Yeah. yeah. You guys are doing this wrong. So what's your number? Ni 99. <laughs> You have, all right, so you have a, it can't be 99. It can't be. You're wrong. <laughs> it's 99. What do you, Michael, what do you have? I got, I got 37. <laughs> I don't know how that's possible. <laughs> I, I, you know, something went askew, and I think I think what we need to do is show how difficult magic can be. David, your number again. After you doubled, added three times by five, and added either one, two, three, or four for club, heart, spade, or diamond was ninety nine. Is that correct? Yes. So your card. I'm going to tell you right now. You're laughing. Was it eight of diamonds? Yes. There you we got go. It. Yay. Michael, what was your card? I mean, what was your number? Mine was 37. 37. After you doubled, added three times five, and then added one, two, three, or four, was 37. Your card is a two of hearts. Wow. Yay. Right, let's do it again. So, Bradford Wells the third here. I'm here with Johnny Jones, our on-the-spot reporter. Johnny, do you do you remember that, or had you heard that spot before? See, like, people we talk about, like, ventriloquism back in the day. My grandfather would tell me how he was inspired for ventriloquism by watching uh, uh, the various ventriloquists of, of, of his day, uh, namely Jerry Mahoney and uh, Charlie McCarthy. And I personally had an interest in in magic inspired by this particular show from 20 years ago. Really? So this spot inspired you as well? Absolutely. To be able to sit by the radio and have someone on the radio predict my card back in Peoria, Iowa, where I was grew up, was inspiring. I could not believe how he got that right. However, his cohorts, you could see a little, uh, little, what would you say, a little mutiny behind the scenes there that uh, was was brewing later on. David, as you know, left the show for those contract negotiations for that year when Angelica took over. But uh, I'll tell you, it, <laughs> it inspired me beyond belief to to enjoy and and follow magic. And now, and whenever Angelica comes to town. 
with her, preco- they call it the precocious magician, right? When that precocious magician, she's now a little more... It's a tongue twister, yet yeah, people, people seem to say it. So. <laughs> the marketing on that is tremendous. Uh, I always get a ticket and watch with my kids, and maybe they'll be inspired by the, for the next generation of Everything Old is New Again. That's true. But it wasn't only Angelica who was inspired by Everything Old is New Again. It was uh, Douglas's son as well, uh, who we also know as uh, uh, the most popular stuffed animal doll maker ever, Leo Viviani. And he was first introduced to America uh, on Everything Old is New Again back in 2016 when he was four years old. Um, you get to brush your teeth, and you and if if you're done, you just look at the the, the stickers. Uh, the stickers of of the superheroes. Yeah. Why, why are you touching the microphone? Cause I want to. It feels like a stuffed animal. <laughs> okay. So, as we know, before he revolutionized the stuffed animal market, Leo Viviani cured the epidemic of sleep apnea. And once again, everything old is new again was there at the inspiration of Leo's dream to cure that ailment. So let's listen now as host Douglas Viviani seems to innocently mention how he had trouble waking Leo when Leo was only four. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's me every morning when fi- I finally am able to wake up Leo from his deep sleep, my three-year-old, to get him out to, to school. <laughs> He's alive! But that actually was uh, Colin Clive. No name you probably have no idea. No, I, I, had a, I thought I had that condition, actually, Colin Clive, and they, they fixed it. But God no, I've never you. heard the name. <laughs> there you go. This is Johnny Jones. Uh, is, I, I'm just listening to those clips that you're playing. I'm, again, I'm here at the the gala, the celebration of everything old is new again at the uh, the Broadcast Museum Hall of Fame in New York City. And and just to hear those clips of those kids back in the day. And then there's a typical dad uh, of a of a four year old trying to to struggle. I mean, we still do that to this day, even though even though you know we now have uh, rather than buses, we simply have the the transporter that brings the kids to school immediately. Uh, I can imagine and still experience to this day difficulties getting up kids in the morning i know uh david cohen had a uh had a, a son as well that was a little older but he they both were able to to what would you say to have a nice uh discussion about children have the children on the air and everything old is new again it became part of their show every so often we're going to advance uh, uh the discussion after this section of the show i know that bradford but uh, any two cents that uh, you you want to add uh here would be more than welcome about uh angelic and Leo and their participation in the show. I mean, we, you know, look, let's give credit to Douglas and David. They were they were great at the radio, but you know, Doug's kids uh, just took it to a whole whole new level. Right, and had to. I was saying, what I'm trying to say, I didn't make, examine that properly because it has been it's quite some time. Douglas's wife, you can know where his the genes came. It from, must sure. be. It must be Douglas's wife. I'm I'm joking, of course. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, partly because. Uh, there's nothing you know, else to do at this there's point. There's nothing else to do other than make fun of uh, make fun of the. <laughs> I just original think it's host. great that that they've spawned a, a world famous magi- uh, magician, and she went ahead and, and solved the world's problems in the Middle East. She got peace there. Leo's <laughs> solving the problems of sleep, sleep apnea. apnea, and he, of course, we know he's the renowned, renowned uh, toy maker of of stuffed animals. It's incredible to see the genesis of these uh, ideas in these children's minds. I mean, back na- everything na- old name two other. Uh, uh, stuffed animal makers. I, I bet you can't. Also, when I grow and when I grow up, I want to be a movie maker. I want to be a dancer. Okay. Bye. Everything old is new again, people. Every bye. Everything's gonna be old, new again, again. We're back right after this. Say, hey, Charlie, why the arm in the sling? Yeah, I walked straight into that busted street sign in front of Frank's Automat. Well, you must have been really sore at him. You said it, pal. I said, say, what's a big idea making a fella trip out there? I was going to sock him right in a kisser. He's all wet. Why, you ought to sue him, Charlie. I have half a mind to do just that. But where am I going to get that kind of dough? Say, I know a fella just got me out of a big jam, and he didn't break the bank. I don't say. 
Yeah, the Law Office of Douglas Viviani. The Law Office of Douglas Viviani? That's right, the Law Office of Douglas Viviani. Viviani. That's what I said, Viviani. Are you a straight shooter? He's a cat's meow. He's on the up and up? Doug's ace is with me. Is that so? He's a bee's bees. Well, that's just swell. You have his number? You can call him at 631-681-1910 or email him at vivianilaw.com. Wait, what, what was that last part? What, email? Yeah, what's email? Vivianilaw.com. When you're seeking to change your career, apply for a promotion, or are trying to find a job, your resume is the first thing that's seen that represents you to a potential employer. Make sure your resume makes a clear, concise, and professional impression of who Now, back to America's Entertainment Pop Culture Talk Show. Everything old is new again, with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. This is Taris Winter, writer and executive producer of The Sopranos, creator and executive producer of Boardwalk Empire, and the new vinyl on HBO. And you're listening to my friends Douglas Viviani and David Cohen on Everything Old is New Again. Welcome back to the History Channel Radio Edition's 2034 Year in Review, where we continue our celebration of the 20th anniversary of Everything Old is New Again. I am Bradford Wells III, here with our on-the-spot reporter, Johnny Jones. Douglas and David worked tirelessly to not only make radio fun again, but also had no shortage of celebrity guests and serious notes on life. Let's turn our attention to the important interview with producer and multi-Emmy Award winner Terry Winter. We'll take some time now to listen to the unique interview, which dealt with serious issues, but also had the trademark fun along the way. You find something. Not that you want to do. That's daydreaming. The need has to be as strong as a junkie's. See, a junkie doesn't want the drug. He needs it. It's a big difference. See, one thing is a kid wants a bicycle. This lady wants a mink coat. This guy wants a Jaguar. He wants a Mercedes Benz. Those are daydreamers. You have to need it. That's the strength, the adrenaline. Well, my need is to perform. I'm a junkie in that sense. That's why. I do what I do. Welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. This is Douglas Viviani. I'm here with David Cohen. And we have a special guest this week, uh, uh, Terrence Winter, who's the um, the force behind Vinyl, the new HBO show then and series that will be airing uh, this weekend. Now, trivia question. You, I know you know this because you just referenced the Munsters. Any, any idea who was speaking there out of character? Uh, well, if it's out of character, it had to be Al Lewis, but that, that sounded like Grandpa to me. I only know him as Grandpa. Yeah, exactly. He never gets out of that. No, uh, they're kind of one and the same. Yeah. yeah. I presented that because he was basically, the way I interpret that is, he was saying, listen, you find something that you love, go for it and do it. Follow your passion. And, yeah, follow your bliss and you will um, be happy. Um, does that make any sense uh, to you in any way, shape or form? Yeah, I mean, you know, thank God I, I took that advice to heart or, or sort of, you know, it wasn't even advice so much for me. I mean, I find, I, I kind of avoided following my dream uh, really out of cowardice more than anything else. You know, I had a deep, dark secret growing up that I wanted to be a TV and movie writer. But growing up in Brooklyn in the 60s and 70s, I mean, you don't know anybody in the film business. I had no idea how to go about making that dream a reality. And it sounded crazy. It sounded to me like something other people do. I didn't know who these other people were, but it wasn't me or anybody I knew. So growing up, as much as I was a fan of television and movies, I never really fully committed to the idea, like, that's what I want to do. I'm going to explore that. Again, it just didn't sound like a legit way to make a living. I'm, I'm not sure that it does be still. <laughs> but, you know, it was sort of like take the safe route, you know, and maybe I could be a lawyer. You know, that was like one of the only two important jobs I knew, doctor and lawyer. Hmm. So doctor was out. But lawyer, you know what, I'm a, I'm a good BS artist. Maybe I can pull this off. Went to law school, as you know. You know, could not have been less interested, as as you can attest. And, and let me anybody. stop right. We'll continue in a minute, but I want to play and set up a little picture in the listener's mind because we had the same classes together, and I remember one specific event where we've got uh, this fellow like uh, going on and on like Kingsfield from the paper chaser. Let's just listen to that for one second to set the tone of law school. You come life. in here with a skull full of mush, and you leave thinking like a lawyer. 
we got this nasty, serious professor. He wrote the book on everything, and he wrote the book on, uh, in this case, you know, procedures of how to bring a lawsuit about. And we're all digging in, and I'm taking notes, and everybody's serious. And there's this little s- scattering of s- 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 behind the scenes. And I hear, you know, I hear Terry's name, and he was sitting. It was like an audience, uh, kind of like a amphitheater. I turn around where he usually sat. We all sat in the same seats, and uh, I don't see him. And uh, I know he was in that class, and word has it that he's laying down on the bench or across two seats, uh, taking a break uh, during this very significant <laughs> professor's presentation. I just it lasted with me these thirty umpteen years later. I cannot remember. I cannot believe that that was going on. Do you remember that? Well, I was asleep. <laughs> so you remember I, sleeping? I, I that's for sure. I take word for it, but I, I entered law school with a head full of mush, and I left with a bigger head full of mush. So <laughs> unlike unlike you and most everybody else in the class, I, yeah, I yeah, again, I I just should not have been there. I was there because it was a way to keep me out of the legitimate job market for a few years, and and you know, I could tell people I was doing something, but I, I had no interest and no passion at it uh, for it, and of course was terrible at it because I just I just didn't care, you know. When I graduated, I was so miserable doing what I was doing that I didn't want to get out of bed and go to work in the morning. And it was more out of that than any kind of, you know, blow to, to pursue my dream. Than, than anything. It was more really born of misery that I finally just said to myself, okay, what is it you want to do when you wake up in the morning? And the answer was, I want to be a TV and film writer. And I finally was able to say it out loud. And it took me until I was almost 30 years old. I was 29. But once I was able to say that and admit it to myself and my friends and to my family and all of whom thought I was insane, I, it, the world opened up for me. It all, I said, this is what I'm doing. I got to find out, I, you know, and there's only one way to do that. And I, I got on a plane. I sold everything I had. I moved to LA. Wow. I got a share in an apartment. I took my law degree off my resume. I got a job as a paralegal hmm. so I could just work from nine to five and come home and just write at night. And I lived like a monk, And but it was so great. It was so clear what my mission was at that point and it was it was exhilarating because finally I was like this is what I want yeah. I know it and it was I, very similar to me and I, I didn't cut you off because I remember getting a phone call and you telling me this and back then uh, it, it planted a seed in my mind well I always wanted to be on the radio I hate to say it you know that's mm-hmm. really one of my dreams and I shouldn't hate to say it but it was something that is was buried because you can't do that you can't make money no, that. You no, can, what, who, does come that? On, who does that and there's no school to go for that really and there's no path and whatever what right. do you think so you I, I didn't come out. I didn't have the courage you had until a couple of years ago to start this show. But I remember that I still to this day remember that phone call in my office when I received it from you talking about this and admiring that this, this guy is going to follow his dream to blazes with anything else. Right, right. And, and you know, it, it is a cliche. You know, people say, do what you love and you'll never work another day in your life. I swear to God, I feel like I haven't had a job for the last 30 years. I, what I do is what I would like to do anyway, whether or not there was money or not. If I won the lottery tomorrow and take money out of the equation, this is how I'd like to spend my days. Telling stories, making movies, writing TV shows. It's so, for me, so satisfying, so clearly what I was meant to do and what I love to do. And, you know, it's it's I always think, God, like if I was born 500 years ago before TV was invented, what would I have done? <laughs> so you'd, be, you'd be William Shakespeare is what yeah. you'd be. <laughs> In know, my yeah, view. Uh, do you feel there's like something inside of us as, you know, that, that, that we sometimes don't listen to, but regardless, is there this voice that's telling you what you should do? Well, yeah. No, you know, more importantly, uh, you know, the converse is there's a lot of voices telling you what you shouldn't do. And, and a lot of those people, uh, you know, form your own negative imp- impressions about you. Yourself, you know, I was, I, you know, it's, I you know, always say like, you know, there were probably five people in your life that, you know, if they encourage you the right way or discourage you the right way, can completely change the course of your life. Usually, your parents, some siblings, a friend, a teacher. You get the right five people behind you, you can do anything. But if you get the wrong five people, you know, just breathing this negativity down your neck, and you can't do this, and dissuading you from from trying things, you, re- it's, it's really hard to pull out of that. And you know, it, it took me a really long long time to finally just say, I don't care what anybody thinks. I know in my heart this is what I want to do, and this is what I, I was born to do, and I want to pursue it. And you know, a lot of that, a lot of that negativity, I think, is, is people... 
you know, they're saying what they're really saying to you. They say you can't do that. They're really saying I can't do that. Right. I can't right. do that. Therefore, why do you think you can do it? Yeah. Right, you, know, you exactly. think, oh, Mister, who do you think you are going on the radio? Really? Right. You, think, you know how hard that is. You know, every, if you would have stopped every time something was hard, you know, you would have been. You'd still be working at McDonald's. And if it, if it wasn't hard, then everyone would be doing it. Exactly. Uh, welcome back to uh, Everything Old is New Again, uh, intro, re- retrospective of uh, this 20 years of this show, the successful uh, uh, happenings of Everything Old is New Again. I'm here, Johnny Jones, with uh, with Bradford Wells the third, and we'll come back right after this to discuss uh, more thrills, action, and adventure that went on on Everything Old is New Again back 20 years ago. <laughs> This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Hi, this is Paul McGann, the Eighth Doctor, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. Hey, this is Daphne Ashbrook, and you're listening to Everything Old is New Again. It's lovely. Welcome. This is Davros from Doctor Who, and you are listening to Everything Old is New Again. (laughs) <laughs> with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Be very afraid. Welcome back to the History Channel Radio Editions 2034 Year in Review. We continue our celebration of the radio show Everything Old is New Again as we look back on its 20th anniversary. As we know, this show, and I'm here with on the spot reporter Johnny Jones has really brought a lot of fun back to the radio. But as Johnny, you know, you can laugh and listen to the clips of pop culture. But the radio show also addressed that age-old question that's haunted civilizations from the dawn of time. What is the meaning of life? The favorite, favorite show that is always a clip or a reference to Star Trek throughout many of their shows. Uh, they dove into that uh, discussion and solved it with the armchair philosophy of none other than Star Trek right here. I, I want to ask you for your interpretation of what the meaning of life is because you're orbiting the Earth in the old John Glenn uh, uh, capsule at present. I mean, think of a family watching that show in the 90s when it was on uh, and turned the TV off and had a discussion prompted by by this, not to be pie in the sky, but you know, there may have been a couple of sentences said. What do you think of that episode? Do you think that answer is sufficient or not? And uh, you tell me, did that happen? Or... It, it did on occasion, Douglas, but most of the time those discussions were with you. <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing. You knew enough to tell Savick that how he faced death is at least as important as how he faced life. Just words. But good words. That's where ideas begin. Maybe you should listen to them. So what, what, what is he saying there? What, to you, Richard? I mean, what, what does it really mean, you know, how you deal with death is how, as important as how you deal with life? Well, that was such a powerful scene that you just put on, uh, Douglas. And, you know, uh, it's important. It's basically character and actions. It's not just about how you face death or life. It's, it's our everyday living. Our actions define our character. Welcome back uh, after hearing all of that and now that we've solved the mystery of life. That is fun, right? They, it is kind of fun to look at pop culture and see how pop culture affects us with that very serious question. And everything old is new to get then they kind of perfected that. Yeah, and, and really it was groundbreaking at the time. I mean, today it's become much more commonplace. But again, to put it in perspective... You know, the, the, discussing the meaning of life back in 2014 was, you know, a real serious discussion, and it didn't really refer to any, uh, you know, pop culture groundwork, you know, and I, I think that made it made a serious discussion just more fun to have. Exactly. And then we turned to their rogues gallery. They had a number of people. There was, that was Dr. Richard Richter you heard on many Star Trek shows. Uh, we also, they turned to Chris Galvin, who was uh, fighting and, and still fight, uh, fights the, the, the good fight to this day. Uh, he was fighting an illness back in the day. And, and uh, let's hear what his perspective was on, on that fight. And I get a call that uh, some new residents who were in the uh, apartment part of the complex uh, needed uh, me to bring over Tylenol because the young daughter uh, had a high-grade fever. And I uh, brought her the Tylenol. She came right up to me, and I held her in my arms, and you know, and I could feel like the heat coming off of her forehead. And she took the Tylenol, and she was better. And the next day, she came to visit me. And um, you know, for the next three years, we were uh, like uh, father and daughter. And you know, within a week, I'd found out that she was HIV positive along with her mom. 
but so I knew at that point early on that you know if I choose to love her that uh, it's going to be a you know rocky road and then you're going to go through things and we had you know played hide and seek like you couldn't believe and uh, and we went to parades and we went to amusement parks and you know of those three years that we got to be together uh, there was much more joy than there was uh, sorrow you know and and at the end you know, I remember thinking I lifted weights all my life, been an athlete, and, you know, it didn't matter how strong I was, I couldn't stop, you know, uh, her eventual demise, but I, I did get to, you know, and I, but I carry her with me every day, and I pray for her every day, and, and her family, so, you know, that, I think that makes me stronger, most people don't get to have that experience like that, I feel blessed that I had that experience. A very positive uh, gentleman and inspirational, certainly the turn the show, uh, just as life is fun for sure, but also some of the, if you want to call it fun, is examining life and how can you overcome obstacles in life and and what is life all about. Uh, the, ter- the show did uh, approach that every so often. I think that is to their credit. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we have even more, right? Yes, we have uh, psychic medium George Anderson answering the question uh, of why we are here on Earth, basically uh, turning to his point of view, speaking with uh, the dead and what their uh, advice is uh, to him through his many, many years of, of readings. Let's listen to George Anderson for a moment. Why we're here on Earth as opposed to just always being in the hereafter. What's kind of the purpose of being here? This is the proving ground. We're the heroes and heroines that we come into this dimension to face and experience, you know, trials, tribulations, growth. It is definitely a proving ground, a place where you can progress and grow spiritually. You can do the same thing over there, but it's just that here it's much more challenging because we're subjected you know, to so many negativities, too. So that was a little, I don't know, a little different perspective, and they did certainly talk about pop culture in both of those last clips, but we just heard from the, the individuals themselves. Uh, it, it was, uh, it was I don't know, kind of interesting to hear his point of view, whether you are on board or not, as to whether he's speaking with the dead or not. At least he gave a point of view standing behind that of what their advice was about life. That's right. And... Um What's this next one? This is a curious clip, I think, coming up. This is up. curious. This is very interesting where the, the boys were discussing this themselves using their own kind of heart and trying to figure out what, uh, what, what I don't know, I guess you could say what your bliss is. What is life about? What you should do? Um, and following up on maybe Terry Winter's point of view, let's hear, let's hear it. We'll talk about it when we get back. Right after this. The bottom line of the philosophy, to boil it down, is to live a good life, one that, that you're going to be happy living. Follow your bliss, is what he used to say. And the bliss is this, this soul, this light that's inside of you, just like Luke, that's drawing you to a certain direction to do something, whether it's going to be successful monetarily or not, whether it's something that is accepted by uh, society in general or not. It, whatever it is, you're, you've been implanted with a... What if you never find it? Then, then, your, then your bliss was the search itself. That's what was if wow. you if you accept that accept the the part of the bliss or what makes you happy is the search not finding the search not achieving the goal you, you found the success you're a lot life. smarter than I ever really thought you are <laughs> I'll take that that's as a pretty compliment insightful. But, uh, <laughs> no I'm that's that's really insightful. There you go, David Cohen uh, giving a rare compliment to his counterpart. That was a rare compliment, <laughs> but but it sounds like it was well deserved. That was a really good uh, perspective. And and uh, you know the we all know now that that's uh, that's on T-shirts everywhere, and uh, we've seen it at the Super Bowl where people are quoting that show and talking about following your bliss. So that certainly did catch on, sort of like an L. Ron Hubbard type of uh, uh, <laughs> type of presentation. And Viviani's been able to ride that wave for years now. Oh, definitely. It, the show is a lot like, you know, back in the day, there were uh, f- movies that, that generated a lot of quotes, and people would wonder, hey, where did that, that common saying come from? What movie did that come from? And this was the first radio show that really became a foundation for, for so many, you know, idioms that, that became ingrained in the culture, and Follow Your Bliss was one of them. And I don't think a lot of people know that that came from Everything Old is New Again. Yeah, I mean, the, the genius of the show goes beyond. I mean, this is you really, if you take a look at it, uh, that's why we here at the New York City Broadcast Hall of Fame to induct these two gentlemen, who 
who are no longer speaking. We we'll hope we can get them back together, and we'll investigate that uh, on our next show to see if we can. Uh, you know, they're in their eighties now at this point. It is a shame, and and when the Queen of England knighted both of them, uh, it was a shame that they didn't appear at the same time uh, to accept the, that that royal honor. Exactly. We'll be back on everything else again next week. When I grow and when I grow up, I want to be a movie maker. I want to be a dancer. Okay. Hi, everything old is new again, people. Every 